Holmes. Anything to give Holmes? Look on us. Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. When I was at school, we did a Dickens novel in one of our years, I think it was in uh, fifth grade or fifth form, and uh, it was Great Expectations. I hadn't read any Dickens up to that time, but we ploughed through that <laughs> for uh, quite a considerable period. And you'll remember, those of you who know the story will know it's about a young fella who was called Pip, and he lived uh, in very poor circumstances with his sister and his sister's husband. And uh, that all changed through a, a miraculous uh, round of circumstances where further in the story of Great Expectations, he, uh, came, he was given a, a great inheritance, a heritage of money. And as a result of that, he left uh, the area uh, down in uh, Devon or Cornwall, wherever it was, and uh, was taken to London and turned made into a gentleman over a period of time. Great expectations, a great change in his life. It was for the good and uh, for the not so good. And that is uh, uh, the story, basically what Dickens's book, Great Expectations, is about. So I want to ask you this morning, what are your expectations? In uh, the 17th of June, 1579, that's 441 years ago, Sir Francis Strait set sail from, I think it was Plymouth in England, and he uh, circumnavigated the world, and he, and he arrived on that date, I told you, the 17th of June, 1579, on the west coast of what we now, as uh, the United States of America, in uh, what is Northern California. And it just so happens that uh, we were there two years ago when we went on a trip with our son and uh, daughter-in-law and two grandchildren and we passed this uh, bay where Drake landed, not knowing that, that at the time, I didn't even know he got to America and uh, we needed a break after driving two or three hours and it looked a lovely little bay so we got down from the highway freeway and we wound our way down to this bay and I was walking along uh, the foreshore there and there was a big uh, rock set in, uh, you know, in concrete and on it was a brass plaque. So I thought, I'll try and see what it says. And to my surprise, it gave the details of the time that Sir Francis Drake had set, had landed there way back in 1579. I got quite excited about that. I didn't even know he'd gone, got there or got that far. But it, it said of Francis Drake, somebody wrote this, he was uh, the first Englishman to sail around the world in the Golden Hind. 
and they described him this way. They said, he always looked out on life as though he expected doors to open before him through which he would pass to magic realms and great experiences. So what are your expectations? I got an article here that was in the uh, Popular Mechanics in March 1996, and it's entitled, Did I Really Say That? Well, who, here's some quotes from some people who uh, expectations meter was uh, quite low. Let me tell you some of them here. Uh, in 1943, Thomas Watson, then chairman of IBM, said, I think there is a world market for maybe five computers. And the Popular Manic Mechanics magazine itself wrote in 1949, it said, Computers in the future may weigh no more than 1.5 tonnes. And then an engineer at the Advanced Computer Systems Division of IBM in 1968, commenting on the microchip said, but what good is it? What good is it? In 1963, I think, no, 1962, the Decca Deca Recording Company, rejecting the Beatles, wrote, we don't like their sound and guitar music is on the way out. Charles H. Jewell, Commissioner of US Office of Patents in 1899 wrote, everything that can be invented has been invented. I'd say his expectation level was possibly zero. In 1981, Bill Gates, then uh, the world's richest man, he wrote, 640K of RAM ought to be enough for anybody expectations. Do you have expectations today? I wonder. In the account we read in Acts chapter 3, the man crippled from birth, we are told, looks straight at Peter and John, expecting, expecting to get something from them. What are you expecting today, tomorrow, this week, this year? Are we just turning the handle? Are you expecting something, something great? What did the poor man crippled from birth expect that day? It would have started like any other day. Family members carry him uh, to one of the city gates, a busy thoroughfare of Jerusalem. So there was some hope of receiving something as he eked out an existence begging. I suppose the best he could expect was that passers-by might give him some money or some food. But Peter and John were on their way to the temple at three in the afternoon, and they come upon him at the gate because that was a heavy traffic area. And the man asks them for money, and uh, uh, they respond to him. Let me read to you verses four to 10. Peter looked straight at him, as did John. Then Peter said, look at us, so the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, silver or gold I do not have, but what I have I give you in the name of Jesus Christ, walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. I'm sure this dear fellow didn't expect that that was going to happen on that day. What is your expectancy level? Are we the types that sit by the road with our bowls in our hands just waiting for things to happen as we eke out an existence of life? Well, let's look at the different perspectives of expectation that happened here. Let's take the example of the two disciples involved in this incident. First of all, Peter. Long before the events of this day, when God used his spirit to fill the disciple to bring release and healing to the man born crippled, long before Peter was a witness to the crucifixion and resurrection, there was a day in Peter's own life where Jesus mapped out his expectance 
of him. We find that in John verse one, uh, uh, chapter one, verse 42. It says, Jesus looked at him, that's Peter, and said, you are Simon, son of John, you will be called Cephas. You are, you will be. You are, you will be. You are Simon, weak as water, unstable as sand, a bad case of foot in mouth disease that he suffered from. I know it's Simon, and you know it. But Jesus says to him, I have expectations of you. You will now be called Cephas, Peter the Rock. And before the Lord was finished with Peter, and when the Holy Spirit came upon him, that's exactly what he became. So Peter, late in life, was able to write in the letters that he wrote. We notice 1 Peter 1.13, this verse. He wrote this. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. What's he saying there? He's saying there, be expectant. Be ready. Expect something will happen, that God is at work. Be self-controlled, wrote Peter. Set your hope fully on the grace to be given you when Jesus Christ is revealed. And before the Lord was with, through with Peter, he was exactly that. And the legend is, if it's correct, that Peter died, he stood rock-like, witnessing for his Lord, refusing to be crucified in the same way as his Lord and Master, upside down, head first. The man of rock. You are, says Jesus, you shall be. What's Christ's expectations of you? Have you inquired of him? Have you asked him? Is Jesus saying to you this morning in 2020, you are, you shall be. You are, you shall be. Now let's look at the other disciple in this story, John. Remember, he was a rough, tough fisherman working with his father Zebedee and brother James when they were called from the uh, shores of the Sea of Galilee. And Mark 3, 17 states, it was Jesus who gave the nickname to John and his brother James, Sons of Thunder. Why? Well, he tells us, they were always arguing, always arguing. Ah, but Jesus had work to do with John. You see, you are a wild, tough, rough, probably loud mouth fisherman, but you shall be, you shall be. What did John become under the grace of God and by his spirit? He becomes, we are told, the disciple of love. So later in his life, John writes, John 3, 18, in the letter, Dear children, let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions and in truth. But with actions. Be expectant. You are, you shall be. How's it with you? Do you believe that you are a person of whom Jesus has great expectations? Dare to be expectant. To open to all that God has for you as we face this year of change. We don't know what's ahead, but we know God does. And we know he'll work his purposes through it for us. In Acts 3, 5, it says, the man gave them his attention. That's Peter and John. So far as he was concerned, they were just two men like any others that passed by that day. But as far as they were concerned, the two disciples, that filled with the light, love and compassion of Jesus, here was a man who desperately needed help. They knew man couldn't do it, but God could. So Peter looks, at, sees the man and he says to him, look at us, look at us. And so the man looks up and the Bible says, so the man gave them his attention expecting to get something from them. Often we are remiss in the matter of conveying to people those with needs, problems, difficulties, 
conveying to them with confidence that there is hope. There is a way out. As we live our lives, are we despair creating by nature or hope creating? Are we glass half full people or are we glass half empty people? Our expectancy in our relations with one another. Do we have the confidence that God is waiting to work through each of us? That if we function correctly as the body of Christ, then the unexpected will happen. Dare to be expectant. Our expectation where God is concerned should be, as Psalm 62.5 says in the Authorised Version, My soul wait thou only upon God, for my expectation is from him. In the incident in Acts 3, we are told in verse 10, all the people were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened. Further in the next verse, the man clings to Peter and John, and it says, all the people were astonished and came running to them. And Peter grabs hold of this opportunity, and from the verses we didn't read till later in the chapter, he tells them the story of Jesus. And in verse 16 he says to them, It is by faith in the name of Jesus, this man who you see and know was made strong. There's the secret. The secret. By faith in the name of Jesus. It's when the God does the unexpected, then people... Uh, God does the normal for God. When God does the unexpected, people come running to find the answers. And Peter tells the crowd, he says, look, don't look at us. I told the man to look at us because we were human agents through which the miracle power was to flow to him. But Peter says to the crowd, if you're looking for an explanation, this is God's doing. John and I expected God to work, and he did. From this day on, this man will expect God to work, and he will. Dare to be expectant where God is concerned. Expect God to give hope uh, where there is no hope. Hope even when everything is against you. So what's the secret here? Was it some special powers that Peter and John had? Well, the secret is in the naming the name of Jesus. Naming the name of Jesus. In Acts, that is a repeating phrase. Time and again in a passages, it says, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. It is in the name of Jesus, which is the ingredient, the spiritual glue, which makes the incredible happen. In Acts 2.38, Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptised, every one of you, what? In the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Salvation. In Acts 3 6, in our reading here, it says, Silver and gold have I none, says Peter, but such as I give you in the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. That's healing. In Acts 8 16, it says, They were baptized in the name of Jesus. Baptism. In Acts 9 27, it says, but Barnabas took him and brought him, that's Paul, to the apostles and declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way and he had spoken to him and how he had preached boldly at Damascus. How? It says, in the name of Jesus. Power in preaching. When we preach, in the name of Jesus. Acts 9.29, we're told, and he spoke boldly 
in the name of Jesus. The frightened disciples before the resurrection are now bold and willing to stand up for Jesus and pay the price and the cost of doing that. In Acts 16, 18, Paul says, Being grieved and turned, he said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus to come out of her. And he came out of her the same hour. It's in the name of Jesus that Satan and the devil can be confronted and uh, the power of Jesus can overcome. Acts 19, 5. When they heard this, it says, they were baptised, how? In the name of Jesus. And it's interesting that this is what the religious authorities were scared about, witless. They, uh, the witless, by the name of Jesus. Acts 4, 18, it says, this is the religious leaders, and they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. They knew it had power. In Acts 5.40, when they called the apostles, this is religious leaders again, and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and then let them go. Well, you could say to me, well, that was first century AD. What about 21st century? Is, is the name of Jesus adequate for this day and age? Well, of course. Well, of course. And you can... Pray in the name of Jesus. You can witness in the name of Jesus. You can do all sorts of things in the name of Jesus. And you can know his enabling and his power for you. The name of Jesus. Got any rivers you think are uncrossable? Got any mountains you can't tunnel through? God specialises in things thought impossible. He can do what no other can do. Dare to be expectant. What does the rest of this year hold for us? What do the coming years hold for us? We don't know. We're walking in, into new territory. But God's asking us to put our complete faith in him and to trust him as the God who knows best, to be expectant that he will meet with us and use us and help us for his glory and his praise. William Carey was born in 1761 and he's first of the modern missionaries. And he said, expect great things from God, attempt great things for God. Expect great things from God. Attempt great things for God. Carey put Bengali into writing for the first time. He translated the whole Bible into four languages. He published the first Asiatic newspaper and dictionaries. He fought for the abol abol abolition, abolition of sati and infanticide. Sati is when, uh, if the husband died, uh, his widow was burnt on the fire pile with him. Infanticide was uh, the killing of children. Carey set up 126 mission schools. He, this is the late 1700s. He made the Bible available to 300 million people. Do you know what he was at home before he answered the call of the God to go to the mission field? He was a shoe repairer a poor cobbler who was told at a minister's meeting to sit down after he'd raised the idea that they should go out and make Christ known to people who had never heard in all parts of the world. And one of the leaders there said, when God pleases to convert the heathen, he will do it without your aid or mine. No, he won't. <laughs> he needs it. He, he's put his faith and trust in people to make known the gospel and the saving message of our Lord Jesus Christ. Isaiah 52 and 3 says, Enlarge the place of your tent. Stretch your tent curtains wide. Do not hold back. Lengthen your cords. Strengthen your stakes, for you will spread out to the right and to the left. 
You are? You will be. How's it with you? Dare to be expectant. I mentioned uh, Charles Dickens when I started this morning, Great Expectations, but another one of his great books is Tale of Two Cities. And it's known for the opening line, which is often quoted as, a, as an example of to gain people's attention. If you're wanting to gain their attention, right at the start of his writing. And the start of that book says, uh, it's the best of times, it's the worst of times. But you know, we can change that as Christian, Christians, because we know with God, it will be the best of times in the worst of times if you but trust him and be expectant and look to him and see his enabling, his power at work in and through you. May God help us to be expectant and to undertake by faith all that he has, all the exciting things that are ahead for us. Well, let's bow in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just pray, we thank you that this uh, passage has been preserved for us and what we can experience and learn from it. And we just pray, Lord, that we might be expectant. We don't just sit by the side of the road with our bowls in our hands waiting for something to happen. But we, uh, Lord, trust you that you are God who has your grand purposes and you're willing to share them with us and to use us for your purposes. And so we commend ourselves to you to that end, giving you thanks and praise through the one through whom it's possible in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour. Amen. Well, thank you for watching today and we look forward to, if you're able to, to join with us again next week. Please do that. We've got somebody special speaking whom you'll love very much next week. The Reverend Mark Wilkinson will be bringing God's word to us and we look forward to that. So have a good week and God go with you for all that he has for you.